think the biggest mistake we make in climate policy is supposing that solutions will be costly. Actually, they'll be profitable. The most important thing in design is to let go of old ideas, let go of your assumptions and preconceptions so you can have new ideas and see the problem fresh. I'm talking to you from my house and office, high in the mountains, 2,200 meters above sea level in Colorado, where temperatures used to go to minus 44 Celsius. But by adapting 6,000-year-old North Chinese passive solar architecture with modern technologies, we need no heating system. And behind me, you can actually see over here some bananas. So I'm a banana farmer <clears throat> in a kind of Manchurian climate with no heating system, and it's cheaper to build that way because you save more money not needing the heating system you save more construction costs, then you pay extra for the super windows, super insulation, and ventilation heat recovery that got rid of the heating system. To save also about 90% of the household electricity, half the water, 99% of the water heating energy. So in the end, all of the resource savings by this house uh, using 1983 technology, it's when we built it, <laughs> Uh, that paid for itself in 10 months. We've done over a thousand building designs, uh, big and small, hot and cold climates all over the world. We call this approach integrative design, where we, we design the building, the car, the factory, the equipment as a whole system for multiple benefits. 慷慨地向人类提供丰富的资源但是随着时代发展的速度越来越快并将研究成果转化为具体的解决方案You wrote the famous essay, um, you know, Energy Strategy, the role not taken in 1976. And a lot of years have passed. And how much progress have we made? And, you know, how has the energy discussion been different now? I think we've made huge progress. In the United States, we're using 60% uh, less energy per dollar of gross domestic product than we were in 1975. In the world, about 90 to 95 percent of the new generating capacity being bought and being added is now renewable. Efficiency is increasing about two percent a year. It needs to go about twice that fast. But I think the the idea in that 1976 essay has caught on completely. That is, instead of just looking for more energy, more of any kind from any source at any price, we should ask, what do we want the energy for? What are we trying to do with energy? Uh, maybe we want hot showers or cold beer uh, or smelted alumina or uh, cooked rice. And for each of these tasks, we should ask how much energy of what kind or quality at what scale from what source will do the job in the cheapest way. It's interesting that sometimes it's not like we don't have enough energies or we don't have enough technologies, but sometimes it requires a change in mindset that you know, everyone looks at you know, energy and environment problem and climate problem as a very costly problem. But you said that it's not necessarily so. We have plenty of great technologies. We will have even better ones. That doesn't mean we shouldn't use the ones we have. 
Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's like if you need a computer, you get the computer available today, you know it will get better and cheaper, but you don't wait. <laughs> you would wait forever, it keeps getting better. However, I think the big thing uh, that strikes me about energy is it's not just technology, policy, uh, bus new business models, new financing methods, it's also about design. And for the hypercar, I mean the ultra efficient car, you came up with this design concept in 1990. So it's been a long time since then to now, um, you know, using ultralight construction for the car. How is the commercialization process for that now? My first hypercar uh, is out in the driveway. It's that carbon fiber German electric car, and it gets uh, 53 kilometers per liter equivalent. So it's about four times normal efficiency. Carbon fiber was thought to be very expensive to get the lightweight, but it saves so many batteries, which are expensive, that that pays for the carbon fiber. It can make the car efficient enough to, to run just on the solar power it, it collects. So it, it's like you, you park it in the sun and each day it, it puts the equivalent of, of eight liters of fuel in the tank. So altogether, we're, we're getting close to a factor 10 uh, in, in efficiency by the time we get through. Let me give you one other example from industry because industry uses half the world's energy and electricity. Half the world's electricity runs uh, motors. Half the motor power runs pumps and fans. But the way we design the pipes coming out of the pumps and the ducts coming out of the fans is full of friction. There are a lot of bends that shouldn't be there. And if we made our pipes and ducts fat, short, and straight, rather than thin, long, and crooked, we would save 80 or 90% of the friction. This would save about a fifth of the world's electricity or half of all the coal-fired electricity. And we would end up getting our money back in less than a year fixing up old pipes and ducts or immediately in building new ones. It's just so interesting that people are not converting if it's as good as you said, right? And I think maybe like people have some, what are some of the, you know, like the major criticisms and how would you respond to that to help people to lessen their, you know, concerns? Most people who hear the, the term energy conservation think of privation, discomfort, curtailment, doing less or worse or without, not doing more with less. Some people think that a lightweight car might not be as safe, but actually what protects you in a crash is not weight but size. And by using light but very strong materials, absorbing six to 12 times as much crash energy per kilogram as steel, because you're using carbon fiber instead, just like race cars, uh, you can be safer uh, because the car can be comfortable uh, and as roomy as you want without being hostile and inefficient. Weight kills people, size saves people. So by decoupling the two with light strong materials, you can save uh, lives, oil, air, and climate, and money all at the same time. I think the biggest mistake we make in climate policy is supposing that solutions will be costly. We got the sign wrong because it's cheaper to save energy than to buy it, let alone burn it. And it's cheaper to supply it now with renewables than with fossil fuels. We're so occupied by our conventional ways of living and our old habits and old ideas that we're not open-minded enough to receive like, new ideas like these. Exactly. Bill Wong Chu Xing, uh, you know, never forget original mind. The most important thing in design is to let go of old ideas, let go of your assumptions and preconceptions so you can have new ideas and see the problem fresh. I used to work for a great inventor, Edwin Land, who invented Polaroid photography, 
You said people who seem to have had a new idea have often just stopped having an old idea. That's the hard part. And once you state the design problem correctly, it's, the solution is self-evident. The question is the hard part, not the answer. Luan Wu, in the past half century, in both China and Taiwan, more than 70 countries have been elected officials and big companies to be energy consultants. He has also participated in projects to renew China's energy. 对于如何帮助中国实现经济增长与能源效率和再生能源之间的平衡，他拥有很好的洞见。That China makes most of the world's solar and wind power and, and buys nearly half of it.、Uh, it is incredible. China, back in 2013, added more solar power than the United States has added for the previous 59 years combined. More wind power in 2020 than the world added in 2019. Unbelievable. The Chinese leaders are very pragmatic, and they—they're they're mostly engineers. They do math very well, and they figure out what's the best buy, and then they buy more of it. Where 10 years ago we showed in detail how the United States could triple efficiency, quintuple renewables, and by 2050 run a、uh, 158%. Bigger economy, using no coal, no oil, no nuclear, a lot less gas, paying five trillion dollars less,、uh, and、uh, <clears throat> emitting about 84 percent less carbon, and、uh, having stronger national security, and not needing any new national laws or inventions, with smart state equivalent to provincial level policies or city policies. Uh, led by business for profit, the actual development of the market has very nicely matched what we proposed. So, of course, the Chinese government asked, "What would this look like for China?" So, their best energy、uh, think tank, the Energy Research Institute of the NDRC,、uh, had their experts and our experts and others we we assembled together、uh, study this. Shows how to run a seven-fold bigger Chinese economy in 2050. Using today's energy seven times more productively, how to burn 80 percent less coal, emit 42 percent less carbon with a seven times bigger economy, and save, by the way, 11 trillion RMB because it's cheaper to get the same energy services from efficiency and renewables. The faster you do it, the cheaper it gets because the more renewables you build, the cheaper they get. So you buy more, so they get cheaper. That's the engine China has mobilized so well, and the same can be true for efficiency. I mean, but you know, some people are saying that as the pressure for economic growth is rising、uh, because of you know a lot of external factors,、um, that people are worried about you know whether we can sustain such quality growth、uh, if we transform you know if we transfer to this new carbon、um, you know economy.、Um, so how do you think about this? Balance, and you know, how do you make up for the loss in jobs in a way? Germany has stopped mining hard coal, and is phasing out its coal-fired power plants without laying off a single miner, because all of the stakeholders work together to figure out a fair transition path. Now, I've been to places like Shanxi, and I, I know that China has very Coal-dependent regions. So does America. So does Germany. But <clears throat> this is a manageable problem. In the United States, for example, we have about half as many coal miners as we have yoga instructors. It is absolutely essential that there be a fair and just transition for those communities and those people, so that they still have good and dignified work that pays well and is healthy and safe. But We will save so much money by making this transition that we can readily pay for those transition costs, and this is no more difficult than the huge changes that societies like China's have made in the past. So. This revolution is happening,、uh, and China, I think, will 
continue to contribute enormously to it. China has 1.4, is it? Billion brains. Well, clearly China has unparalleled technical and organizational capacity to build and install and connect a lot of renewable supply and to improve its factories and so on. I would put more emphasis on integrative design to speed up efficiency in all sectors. 卢安武的经历啊，堪称传奇。拥有十二个荣誉博士学位，曾荣获多项世界大奖，出版书籍三十一本，发表论文超过八百篇，却曾从哈佛大学和牛津大学退学，还曾在包括北京大学、斯坦福大学等十所大学教授完全不同的、自己从没正式学过的专业，比如说道教与生态环境，引令自己永远保持好奇。究竟是什么样的成长经历造就了他呢？ And you do this, I know, by trying to teach、um, very diverse subjects to cultivate your beginner's mind at like ten different universities. How do you do that? So, what what subjects do you pick up? You know, I, I may teach、uh, <coughs> architecture, engineering, economics,、uh, sciences. Uh, all kinds of things to do with energy. I'm not formally trained in any of these things,、uh, so I can have beginner's mind. I don't know too much, but I'm interested in everything and how everything is related.、Uh, you know, Confucius said you should learn as if you're running after somebody you can never quite catch up with, and I've I've done this all my life.、Uh, work in about 20 disciplines.、Uh, Including some seemingly unrelated ones,、uh, a little in medicine, a little in linguistics, a little in great ape language, and so on. But、uh, it's all it's all connected. And I I dropped out of two great universities, Harvard and Oxford.、Uh, Harvard wanted me to specialize. Yeah, Harvard wanted me to specialize too much. And I said, "Well, it's my time and my money. They're both scarce resources. Why can't I study what I'm interested in?" So I'll transfer to Oxford, where I understand they they'll stay out of my way and、uh, let me learn what I want. And they did. Except then I wanted to do a doctorate in energy in 1971, and this is two years before the Arab oil embargo shocked the world. So there wasn't really any place you could study energy. They they said it's not an academic subject, is it? We have no professors in it. Pick a real subject. I said, well, sorry, I think it's about to be an awful mess in just a few years. I need to go work on it. So I'll just resign my fellowship. I was a don at the time,、uh, and go work on energy. And I did. Now they have a few decades later, 300 odd people doing wonderful work in energy, and they have a lot of professors in it. I was just a few decades too early. But you know, I I just wanted to. Jump the fences, walk on the grass,、uh, study what I thought I needed to learn, and the most important thing I could pass to students watching this: a, a smart, motivated person can learn as much about almost any subject in six months as most people in the field know. Not all, but most. And once you understand that, it's utterly liberating. You can go learn whatever you need to. You are definitely someone who thinks outside of the box. What kind of upbringing or parenting? No box.、Uh, no box. <laughs> Even better. So, what kind of upbringing or parenting ha has made you innovative? I was very blessed to have、uh, parents. My father was an engineer. My mother was a、uh, social service administrator and editor. Educated, but also innovative. That is, they didn't have what you might call educated incapacity. Where they had learned too much to have new ideas. It was a great blessing that they had this simple philosophy of raising children: that、uh, you should love your children, support their dreams, and stay out of their way. And in particular, don't don't try to compose their lives for them. So when I was resigning my fellowship at Oxford as a faculty member. Uh, to go work on energy for some environmental group, they were rather concerned that I was giving up this promising academic career, and they weren't quite sure where it would lead. But very kindly, they never told me that. I didn't realize till decades after that they'd been worried about it. 
is they said, well, let Amory make his choices. Uh, stay out of his way. And they did, and it worked out well. Hope, said Francis Bourdelpay, is a stance, not an assessment. But applied hope is not mere glandular optimism. The optimist treats the future as fate, not choice, and thus fails to take responsibility for making the world we want. Applied hope is a deliberate choice of head and heart. The optimist, says David Orr, has his feet up on the desk in a satisfied smirk, knowing the deck is stacked. The person living in applied hope has her sleeves rolled up and is fighting hard to change or beat the odds. So what's the next big thing you want to, you know, may happen? You're definitely, you know, a big dreamer. You're not to dream and may all your dreams come true through hard work. Well, besides being a husband and grandfather and a friend to many people, I would like to continue to make the world better as long as possible. Um, I'm only 74, my parents both lived to 97. Uh, and I think in a spirit of applied hope, uh, I should be able to contribute a good deal longer. I think my, my next big thing is to spread integrative design in all sectors and uses and countries and just make it the standard practice Many wise people have said there's nothing you cannot achieve if you give away all the credit. Everything's going to work out all right in the end. If it's not all right now, it's not the end yet. Don't let it bother you. Just relax and keep on going. Lu Wanwu Jiaoshou ah, very strong energy. He's 70 years old. You wake up early, get ready for our interview. After the interview, he takes his phone and takes my phone. I looked at his house and found all kinds of interesting things to do. 那和他对话呀，不仅是收获了很多新的思路、新的知识，我还深深被他的热情、乐观主义、实践主义所感染。近年来啊，我是感受到气候变化的议题呢，和我们的关系越来越紧密。那有报告显示，就说过去十年呢，是有记录以来最热的十年。而过去五十年来的气候变化现象呢，有百分之九十几的可能都是由人类活动所导致的。那要知道，地球可以没有人类，但人类呢，不可以没有地球。所以，我们每个人呢，都需要出一份力，建设人与自然和谐共生的现代化，才是真正以人为本的可持续发展之道。